Francisco and some other panel. Um, so yeah, uh, welcome everyone for showing up at this early-ish hour. Although, you know, it's maybe a little easier to get up this early on Memorial Day for uh, Balticon where we're all at home than one where we might have been at parties last night, but uh, such as it is. So welcome, this is my presentation on um, clocks in the rocks. So let me get that up and going. Um, do, do, do. Hang on, cancel, let me start this again. Um, naturally, tech issues, but that's okay. Share screen, there it is. Okay, share. Um, so this is a presentation on determining the age of rocks and fossils. Um, now, this is stitched together from the bits and pieces of separate lectures from various courses I teach. So um, I will hopefully keep it under time to get through all the slides, uh, but um, I will be answering questions afterwards over in the Discord channel, um, should I not get through anything, everything. You can ask questions in the Q&A. I have no, um, no, definitive plans if I'll be able to answer them during the main session, but we'll see. Uh, so welcome. For those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Tom Holtz. Um, I am a principal lecturer in vertebrate paleontology in the Department of Geology at the University of Maryland. I'm also a research associate with the Department of Paleobiology at the National Museum of Natural History. And if you want to follow my Twitter feed, um, it's down over here. And my presentation today is going to look at the questions of how, you know, when we researchers say that an event occurred at such and such time, you know, the impact at the end of the age of dinosaurs was 66 million years ago. How do we get that information and, and how do we tell geologic time? So this is basically a review, but I want to cover um, various aspects of both stratigraphy and geochronology, and I'll explain those terms in a bit. So. How do we determine the age of fossils? Well, the short answer, we figure out the age of the rocks in which the fossils are buried. Yay, you can all go now. Okay, now, obviously it's more to it than that. I have to explain how we figure out the age of fossils. As I like to say, the future is not written in stone, but the past is. Um, and that the past is there under our feet, the data is in the strata, or the data is in the strata, either works as long as you make it rhyme. Uh, so before I get to the specifics, I do want to address uh, an important aspect here, and that is that there are two aspects to time when we talk about geologic time, or indeed any kind of time. Um, there's both relative time, which is the description of the sequence of events. A came before B, B before C, C and D occurred at the same time, etc. And that's distinct from numerical time. Numerical time is dates or durations expressed in years or some other units. Um, so sometimes people will refer to this as absolute time. Uh, but in fact, that's sort of a misnomer, because after all, um, we can be absolutely secure of relative time, of the sequence of events, and in contrast, numerical time is an estimation, it's a calculation, and therefore, like all calculations and estimations in science, it's going to have error bars. Um, and it turns out relative deep time is much easier to read, especially out in the field, than numerical deep time. Not surprisingly, the discovery of how to read relative sequence in time was made much earlier than our understanding of how to read numerical time. And it's something you can actually do out in the field. You can be working out at an outcrop and determine sequences of events and even maybe where you are in the relative time scale uh, without being able to say for certain we are at 87.35 plus or minus 0 0.2 million years ago. 
Um, and I have a question from Renee already, which is, could we get a poster of that rock chronology illustration at the very beginning? Um, I'll try to put a post about that later on, but it, I believe it was, it is by Ray Troll and it would have been trollart.com, I believe is his website. Ray Troll is a great illustrator uh, and musician and uh, he's contributed to paleoichthyology and has lots of great cartoons that will pop up occasionally in here. So well, let me get back to PowerPoint. So I'm going to begin with working with the aspects of stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is the branch of geology concerned with the order and relative position of strata, that is layers of rock, and their relationship to the geologic time scale. Oh, I kept on. Oh, there we go. So it is stratigraphy that allows us to see and reconstruct the history of the world. Stratigraphy as a science began really in the 1600s. It is one of the oldest parts of the field of geology. And it has certain fundamental principles to it. And these are things that, you know, for many of us today, it's like, duh, obvious features, but someone had to figure that out. And one of the first principles of, of stratigraphy is the principle of original horizontality. And that's the observation that the sedimentary rocks formed by sediment settling out in a depositional environment and forming horizontal layers or strata when deposited. And most of us go, well, duh. But the thing is, if you didn't realize that, um, you might not be able to do any of the next several steps of, of geochronology and, and stratigraphy because it's original horizontality and they don't stay that way. Lots of things can happen to strata to bend and fold and fault and overturn them. So here's a spectacular fold uh, almost at a right angle. Uh, here's one for Marylanders. Uh, if you take Route 68 out west, um, you will pass through Sidling Hill with this wonderful synclinal fold. Um, here's one where we've got rocks tilted and there's a fold within the tilt. So lots of stuff can happen to the rocks. So they're no longer horizontal. But if we recognize they started off that way, that gets to our next principle, the principle of superposition. And that's the observation that unless they've been overturned, the strata at the bottom of a set of sediment were deposited first. And the ones above that are younger, that is closer to us in time. And the ones above that are younger still, etc. Now, how much younger is this stratum compared to that stratum? Eh. You know, we don't know that to begin with. But, but we can recognize that it is absolutely younger. So this gives us relative sequence in time even if it doesn't give us numerical date in time. And since the internet is full of cats, uh, there are lots of illustrations of scientific principles of geology with cats. It's not any of our cats, although it does look like one of the cats that hangs around outside in, in your, on your geology books demonstrating superposition. So unless someone snuck these books, so snuck those books in there, that book had to be put down first, and then that one, and then that one, and then that one, and then the cat lied, laid on top of it. Another aspect of this means that all other things being equal, deeper equals older in geology. Now, because rocks get folded and faulted and overturned, um, nature doesn't like stuff sticking up um, and so it weathers it down. And a very common aspect of a set of rocks is to find what we call unconformities. Uh, these are erosional surfaces or weathering surfaces. So we had a set of strata deposited. They lithified, that is turned to stone. They were folded. They were worn down. And then new strata were deposited on top of that. And so we have this weathering surface, this erosional surface or unconformity there. Um, and the existence of unconformities led to the next major principle of, phys of physical stratigraphy, which is the principle of cross, of co sorry, the principle of cross cutting relationships. Now in class, I would normally then do a demonstration where I would hold up a piece of paper. Well, I have a, a piece of paper with a tear in it. And I would say, which is the more likely scenario? And I would make a cut motion in the air and then stick the paper there or then secondly, alternatively, put the paper there and then tear it. 
So obviously the paper has to be there before you can make the tear. And that's the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Any structure, a fold, a fault, a weathering surface, an igneous intrusion, whatever, which cuts across or otherwise deforms strata is necessarily younger than the rocks and structures it cuts across or deforms. So here we have a bunch of vertically oriented strata. This is at Sikar Point. It is uh, near Edinburgh, Scotland, where I was supposed to be going in early June, but mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and then there's a weathering surface, and then there's a bunch of strata on top of it. And you might naively think, well, these ones are on top and these ones are below. So these had to come later, but neither of these are horizontal. So we know there's been some overturning involved or some, some folding involved. Well, if we look at it, there is an erosional surface here and the erosion cuts into the layers that are down here. They don't continue, they're truncated by it. And in contrast, the strata above lie directly parallel to, we would say conformable to the unconformity. And so we can work out, and indeed James Hutton, one of the great stratigraphers, uh, used this as his, uh, one of his examples, that down here, these strata are older than the erosion because they are cross-cut by it. And the strata up here are younger because they are deposited on top of it. So now we have a sequence of events. We can use this principle of cross-cutting relationships in all sorts of ways. So here is at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, which I've actually never walked all the way down to the bottom. Someday I would like to. And then you come out of the canyon under someone else's power. Um, and so here's the Colorado River. Here's a set of sedimentary rocks that were deposited. Here is a, an igneous intrusion, that is a flow of, of magma that entered a crack or generated a crack through that rock. Here's an unconformity that erodes both the sedimentary strata and um, the igneous intrusion, and on top of it, a new layer of strata. And so we now have a sequence of events. These sedimentary rocks were deposited first, and then an igneous intrusion, and then a weathering event, and then this stratum. And then there's actually an even more recent event, and that is the Colorado River cutting through all of this so that we're seeing it at the side. And therefore, using these principles, we can begin to reconstruct the sequence of stuff that occurred at any given spot. So here we have a set of strata that were deposited horizontally, they were folded, they were eroded, a new set of strata was deposited on top of that, etc. So these principles of physical stratigraphy developed in the 16 and 1700s allowed geologists to begin to figure out for any given location what was the sequence of events, even if they didn't know how far back in time they occurred. And so you can take as a given block of, uh, of rock here and examine it. So picture, as I tell students, you know, picture, you know, God has a lightsaber and he cuts out a cube and lifts it up. And he's a God, he could have a lightsaber if he wants. And then we could figure out, you know, these strata were first and then this intrusion and then this erosional event and then these strata and then this intrusion and then this erosional event and then these strata on top of it. And that's more stuff than we knew before. But how can we relate what went on here to 10 kilometers away or 100 kilometers away or another continent? How can we correlate from region to region? Well, the next thing that was recognized was correlation using formations, what we call lithostratigraphy. And that's because we find that certain units of rock, certain beds of rock, extend over broad regions with the same sort of physical properties that you could recognize out in the field. And here, so here we correlate strata from the Grand Canyon to Zion National Park to Bryce Canyon National Park. And we see there's overlap of some of these characteristic units. So a formation is a package of strata deposited over a region for a period of time when a particular depositional environment was present. And because it's the same depositional environment with the same sources of the sediment, you'll have the same colors, the same type of sediments, the same fossils, similar sedimentary structures, etc. We can trace these out over broad regions. 
one way to think about it is if you looked in the modern worlds, the sediments that are depositing down the Mississippi Valley will eventually potentially be a recognizable strata or set of strata, a formation that we could then in future time look back and say, oh, this stuff was deposited over the Mississippi Valley and was a recognizable formation for future geologists. Oh, um, just to answer the question, was it troll or troll? It was troll, as in, you know, troll of Scandinavian mythology, ray troll. Oh, my volume dropped out in the last slide a while ago. Okay, hopefully, is, is, um, if, hopefully I'm still, um, you could still hear me. Is everyone still hearing me? Okay, well, we'll see. Done and done. You're good. I'm keeping an eye on the Q&A Q stuff, so. So good, okay, excellent. All right, so back to here. So we can look back into geologic time and recognize where different formations were being deposited over a region. So here we are back in the Cretaceous when, so here's Colorado, Utah, um, Montana, Wyoming, uh, a shallow seaway. So this would be marine deposits forming here, coastal deposits through here, uh, lowland deposits, coastal plain deposits, uh, upland deposits over here, so forth. And each of those regions would wind up being a different formation uh, from our point of view, because it would have a different characteristic set of sediments, a different characteristic set of fossils, etc. When you're out in the field, the way you recognize the transition from one formation to another are changes of color and sediment type and so forth. So here in the Bighorn Basin, Wyoming, this is the famous Morrison Formation. That's our look at the Jurassic world, the late Jurassic world of the American West. And on top of it, Above this unconformity, as it turns out, is the Cloverleaf Formation, a younger unit with a different set of fossils, a different sediment source, etc. In fact, those two rocks I showed there, there's the Morrison, there's the Cloverleaf, and that boundary right there that I highlighted in red, that's what we were seeing as expressed. And so when we look out where there's a bunch of, of strata that are exposed, in this case on the Bighorn Basin, um, um, looking coming from the Bighorn Mountains proper into the basin, a set of strata, and we're seeing the sequence of events of geologic time in this part of Wyoming, representing radically different environments, whether it's a dryish coast, uh, a dryish um, sediment coming down from the young Rocky Mountains to a slightly wetter one, to the flooding of that area, and we're in the deep sea, etc. Or in this case, where we get a sequence of lava flows covered by mountain building events, so sediments draining from that, and then the seaways coming in, and then the whole area under deeper water, so carbonates are forming. And what I was describing here is in fact, Western Maryland. Western Maryland from the end of the Precambrian to the Cambrian. Each of those wind up being a different formation. And you know you can get places like the Grand Canyon where you can hike down and see these formations. So many of these formations extend for great distances. And therefore, when we see those rocks, we know they were formed when that environment was in that region at that time. So if we look at, I hear one of my cats going mewing. Okay, so for a lot of people, they think, aha, when we see one formation to a next formation, that transition represents a change in time. And when we see those same two formations transition from one to another, they'll say, aha, that's the same moment in time. And this screwed people up for a while early in geology because formations represent environments and the same environment might migrate from spot to spot over time. So if you look at the rocks at the, um, at the top of the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon, we find the sequence of a sandstone, a shale, and a limestone. And so we see the transition from the Tapit sandstone to the Bright Angel shale here at one spot of the Grand Canyon. And over here, we see it at another. And when we get a different metric of time, in this case, it's the change of the fossils, we find out that the transition from the Tapit to the Bright Angel was an, un well, sorry, was a, um, in the early Cambrian over here, but younger in the middle Cambrian over here, what's going on? 
Well, that's because the formations represent environments. And yet any given moment of time, all three of these formations might be deposited in different spots. So the Tapetes sandstone is older over here. This would be to the west in Arizona, and it gets younger as we get to the east. And the same thing for the Bright Angel Shale or the Muav limestone. So how can we get towards understanding these moments in time? Well, one thing that was considered was um, recognized early on was changes of fossils. So this is moving from lithostratigraphy to biostratigraphy, correlation using fossils. The advantage of fossils is that organisms can have the potential to extend over vaster differences, vaster, vaster distances than particular environments. So here is a cartoon with red curly cues. These would represent nautiloids or aminoids, some sort of coiled shellfish. These green bullets, those are supposed to represent bellumnoids, the internal shell of a sort of squid-like animal. And down here are blue oysters, which no doubt have a cult. Yeah, the, the uh, geologist who did this intentionally put blue oysters in there for that reason. And so we can see that there is a sequence at these two different sections of blue oysters, the overlap of blue oysters and green bullets, green bullets, and red curly cues. And so we can correlate that sequence independent, as it turns out, of the rock type. The different patterns here represent different rock types. And indeed, if we have more areas, we might be able to extend this succession of fossils lower, that is older in time in one area, and younger in another. And in fact, because these patterns repeat from region to region, we can then see the sequence of fossils from oldest to youngest as sort of a standard pattern, as a common pattern from spot to spot to spot. This was a discovery made in the late 17 and early 1800s, and a lot of geologists at that time, um, starting with William Strata Smith, and he was nicknamed Strata in his own lifetime, began to develop a global geologic time scale, starting with the UK and then moving out from that. Now, not every fossil is equally good for biostratigraphy, for correlation. You want it to be something that's common, that you're likely to find every time you go out to the outcrop. Many fossil species are known from only one individual. That doesn't help, because we already know that that spot in the ground is exactly the same age as that spot of the ground. You want it geographically widespread. As we know today, some species are found in many parts of the world. Some are limited to just a, a particular region. So you want something that is widespread so you can correlate. You want something that's easily preserved. You know, occasionally we'll get fossils that are um, um, that are of jellyfish in really rare circumstances. They're not going to be helpful. You want something with a shell. You want something with distinctive patterns or features on it. So when you pick it up, you go, aha, this is definitely this species and not this other species. Ideally, something that's preserved in multiple environments because different environments will produce different rock types. So in many cases, swimming organisms or floating organisms, plankton are great because they don't care whether it's limey mud or uh, silica-based mud or sand or whatever on the seafloor. They're in the water column above, but when they die, they settle down on the seafloor. Or on land, um, pollen, it spreads all over the place and can land all over the place. So it's pretty useful. And all those points would be moot if you have a species with a really long duration, like um, Lingula, a type of brachiopod, which is relatively unchanged since the Ordovician. When you find a Lingula, you know, you're any time between the Ordovician and now, that's not helpful. That turns out that's a range of about 400 million years. You want something with as short a range as possible. The shorter the range, the better. Because any time you find two outcrops with that fossil in it, you know it occurred sometime between the origin and the extinction of that fossil. So using index fossils, um, and here's the spelling Ray Troll, using those fossils, people built up a geologic time scale during mostly the 1800s uh, based on the comings and going goings of different fossils. At least that was the initial way. And this is something you can actually do, see out in the field, because if you got the outcrop and you knock 
a, a section of rock off and you see at least the macroscopic fossil you could do. As it turns out, microfossils are generally even better, things like pollen or, or plankton and so forth. So yes, we do go back to the lab to check that out. Oh, I should point out, Darwin, as a young man, uh, pointed out that the idea of geochronology, of the geologic uh, uh, time scale, was the most, that most sublime discovery of the genius of man. I want to point out to my biologist friends that, that Darwin considered himself a geologist, especially early in his career. Uh, well, okay, in part because the term biology hadn't been coined yet. And biology, what we would now call natural history, was part of geology. But, hey, that's okay. Now we have a far more complete geologic time scale with numbers, I should add. Now, um, and in the modern world, it's overseen by an organization, the International Commission on Stratigraphy. And our boundaries, which is what you define, we define the boundaries of these geologic time units. Yes, they were originally recognized by fossils, but now the procedure, um, is, oh, I should point out, yeah, there's lots of names there. No one knows them all. No one's memorized them all. You get to know the ones in your part of the time scale pretty well. Uh, so in a pinch, you can bluff using dog breeds. So our decision about where the boundaries are, which of course, no matter what topic there is in science, you will have people that will debate and argue about it, is overseen by this commission. So there are a committee there that will be assigned. This is the committee to find the base of the Cambrian or whatever. You put your forth your proposals, they make a ruling, and there is an official decision of a particular stratum at one part of the world that is the formal lower boundary of that time unit, or that rock time unit, I should say. It's called a GSSP, a Global Boundary Stat Stratotype Section and Point. Where did the B go? I don't know. We don't call them GBSSPs. We call them GSSPs, whatever, deal. Um, so, uh, oh, I see someone pointed out, yeah, the Precambrian hadn't been, so, hadn't been subdivided. Yeah, the Precambrian's all subdivided up, and people are working to develop the GSSPs for those. So this, somewhere on this outcrop, is the GSSP for the Cambrian, formally defined, based on the um, um, based on the presence of a sort of trace fossil, sort of burrow, and related to a shift in carbon isotopes. But ultimately, there is a physical point on that slab that is the base of the Cambrian, and that's our reference point. Now, none of this gets to that question about numbers. And indeed, although people like to talk about the numbers in geology, a lot of geology is done in the context of a relative time scale. But of course, we're interested in numbers. So that's the, the goal of geochronology, of estimating numerical time. How do we figure that out? By the way, I just want to throw a little, um, a little grammar in here. In the geologic time scale, G, lowercase a, M, lowercase a, there goes Inky's legs in front of me. K, and a low, small k, uh, lowercase a, are for billions of years ago, millions of years ago, or thousands of years ago. And the preference, not always followed, um, but the preference is to use a lowercase yr when we're talking about durations. So the time between 1.5 ga and 500 ma would be a duration of one gyr, just to throw that out there. As many of you know, the way to get to numerical time, the, uh, the key way, is the use of radioactive decay and radioactive dating because there are naturally occurring radioactive isotopes that break down from one to another, from a, a parent product to a daughter product, which is also preservable, on a particular rate, that is a particular half-life. Many radioactive isotopes have really short half-lives. Avoid them if you can, because those are the dangerous ones. Um, other ones have extremely long half-lives that have to be estimated in the lab. And the basic principle, the 100 level pr principle, is you take a, a, a part of a rock, or ideally a crystal within the rock, and you measure the ratio of the parent to the daughter. And if there's zero of the daughter, it had just formed. And if there's 50-50, it's been one half-life. And if it's 75-25, it's two half-lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I like this animation. This shows us better. We see the atoms decaying to their daughter product. And so that's what you would do, at least the initial thing, is you look at the parent to daughter ratio, estimate the number of half-lives, calculate the number of half-lives against the measured half-life for that particular isotope, and that gives you an approximation of the age of formation. Different types of isotope series have different half-lives that are of different use in different geological settings. So I'm going to hold off on uh, radiocarbon, on carbon-14, which has such a short half-life, from my point of view, that it's not useful for this sort of um, general geology, although it does have its use in extremely young geology. And there's Inky. <laughs> now, a good aspect is the fact that we've got multiple radioactive series that we can examine with different half-lives. So if in the same rock, we can estimate two different series and we find a similar age, that's stronger evidence that the rock is that age than just one estimation because independent confirmation is always better. So how does this work? In a liquid magma chamber, we've got the ions floating around, but when this stuff crystallizes, <laughs> And it cools, that is with eruption, if it's volcanic, cooling at depth, if it's plutonic, that is igneous rocks that form at depth. When the crystal forms, it's going to lock into place the atoms that were there at that time. Now, different minerals will prefer to use certain elements in them. And the parent element might fit into the crystal in a way that the daughter does not. So we start by locking into place that parent element. And then we have the eruption. And so here we've got an ash layer. So if we find a crystal there, we can estimate from the parent-daughter ratio later on how long it's been since that eruption occurred. And we would know from, um, from superposition that the rocks below had to be older and the rocks above had to be younger. And of course, volcanoes generally don't just erupt once, they erupt multiple times. So we can then have multiple layers. We can de date each of those layers and bracket the ages of the fossils and the layers in between. So we're not actually necessarily dating the layer with the fossil, unless we're really lucky, there happens to be an ash layer there, but we're giving brackets of these and therefore narrowing down the times that were there. There are difficulties with radiometric dating. For one, we can't actually date the sedimentary rock per se, because the age we would get from the crystal in a sedimentary rock would be the age of the source rock that was then broken up and redeposited, and that could be billions of years older. Also, we can't really date metamorphic rocks because metamorphic rocks form by recrystallization, by reorienting the, the crystals and what crystals are associated, so what atoms are associated with which, which crystals, that's going to smear out the original ratio. But we can do igneous rocks rather securely. And thankfully, by combining radiometric dating and the principles of stratigraphy, we can bracket the ages of the strata in between. Too bad there's no way to correlate these rocks with rocks elsewhere. Oh, yeah, wait, there is, and I already talked about it, and that was biostratigraphy. So we can there, thereby take these dates um, and map them onto our global time scale, or first our regional time scale, then our global time scale, and find out where within these ranges um, the ages fell. And that was the job basically of the 20th century, was developing numbers for the geologic time scale. But these are measurements, and any measurement is subject to revision with new information. It might be that we get narrower and narrower uh, plus and minuses, so our precision gets better. We might get better and better outcrops with more and more layers, and that happens. And we can wind up recalibrating the, uh, um, the uh, length of the half-lives, and that's happened. We have recalibrated some of these in recent years, uh, and that's why the numbers do fluctuate. Um, over time. However, here's the 200 level 
geology that you don't get. And that is no one does the parent-daughter ratio. Okay, that's a lie. You actually do that. But a far more common practice is what's called the isochron method. And this eliminates the need for there to be an absence of the daughter product to begin with. Now, it requires three measurements per crystal rather than two. You need the daughter product, you need the parent product, and you need a stable, non-radiogenically produced isotope of the daughter product as well. So for instance here, we've got the parent 87 rubidium, the daughter 87 strontium, and the stable 86 strontium. And then you plot the two of these together. The way this works is at the initial condition, there was the composition of the source magma, which then crystallizes. And as it crystallizes, the different minerals in that, that are coming out of that system will partition out the daughter and parent to different degrees, depending upon which of those elements fits within that particular crystalline structure. Initially, there will be a common ratio there, but over time, each of these is going to decay. The decay rate will be the same, but because the degree of composition of parent versus daughter is different, the flow of this will have been different. Ideally, they all fall along a line, a line called the isochron, the line of, of, of time. The slope of that line scales to the number of half-lives that have passed. The y-intercept gives us the initial condition and the scatter around the isochron gives us a measure, an actual quantitative measure of how well constrained that date is. And so we can then go through and measure for a set of crystals for a rock and get the isochron data and thereby determine the age of the rock. So I'll start this as it comes through again uh, from the beginning. So we start within the magma uh, momentarily. Um, and it's decaying. It's originally zero a daughter, but now there's some daughter. It partitions out, and we could see down here the number of half-lives that have passed. So there's one half-life with a slope of one, and then two half-lives would have a slope of two, etc. And so you could do this for rocks measuring multiple crystals and estimate the age much more securely and without the necessity of zero daughter to begin with. Now, Radiocarbon dating, that is carbon-14 dating, is useful. Uh, and it's something where we can actually measure the organic material in the deposit directly. What happens is organic material takes up carbon from its environment. And there are several isotopes. There's carbon-12 and carbon-13, both of which are stable. And there's also carbon-14, which is radioactive that decays into nitrogen. Now, this isn't gonna happen the same way. That's a cat walking in front of me. I'm not disintegrating. Um, the radio uh, carbon 14 decays naturally into nitrogen, which is not going to stay in the material. It's going to fly out. What you actually do is you get a reading of how radioactive the substance is as it's still giving off radiation. The half-life of carbon-14 is a little less than 6,000 years. So it's very limited utility in classical geology, but it's good for younger geology, for quaternary geology, this recent stuff, um, and for archeology. span Now a complication is the amount of carbon-14 varies in our atmosphere over time. In fact, it got a Nobel Prize for figuring this out. Um, and we can calibrate these against trees, tree rings of known age. We can measure those carbon-14 ratios. And therefore, people who work with carbon-14 have to do a little quantitative uh, uh, chicanery. It's not chicanery. It's just calculations in order to get the age in calendar years. Um, and in fact, you may have seen a, a news item out that the calibration curves for some parts of the world have been um, um, updated just recently. And there goes Inky again. Now, another sort of, uh, of calibration we can do to correlate around the world are global sea level changes. There are various factors like the rise and fall of ice sheets and the expansion and contraction of the mid-ocean ridges, which will cause global sea level changes. Now, these will be superimposed over regional sea level changes that you might see because of the buildup of sediment from erosion or the rise of local mountain ranges, etc. But um, 
a series of geologists, especially those working in the petroleum fields in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, developed a global sea level curve that you could use to correlate a spot from, say, the coastal regions of North America with Europe, with the Mideast, etc. One of the best ways to correlate are marker beds. And these are cases where debris is spread out from something, like say a major eruption. So in this case, it's an ash fall, an ash fall that extends all throughout the American Southwest. And since all that ash came down within the space of you know hours or days, any deposit of that ash fall is exactly the same age. And therefore the stuff it settled on is essentially the same age. And the stuff on top of it would have been um, similarly about the same age. So these are great. The, and a good example of this is the iridium layer that deposited from the impact of the asteroid at the end of the age of dinosaurs. However, it's a good thing there aren't too many marker beds because those are produced by huge disasters. Um, and therefore, you don't want to live on a world with too many of those, although correlation would be a lot easier. Uh, one of the last major things to mention here is radio uh, so, um, magnetic dating. In the 1950s and 60s, it began to be recognized that the Earth's polarity flip-flops through time. That is, what's currently magnetic north is near geographic north, but there are intervals of time when magnetic north is near geographic south. And it turns out these flip-flops can be recorded, or the magnetic field can be recorded in certain igneous and iron-rich sedimentary rocks. And so a magnetic time scale has been developed. Now, sometimes you have people like in certain uh, motion pictures of uh, about 20 years ago, the core, that gives you the idea that a flip-flop on a clock-like basis, and thankfully it doesn't. If it flip-flopped on a regular basis, it would suck as a way of stratigraphy, but it doesn't. It flips off flip-flops on a very irregular basis that we can then, you know, work out the ages from because they're igneous rocks and therefore we can estimate the age. Because it's so irregular, if we have a section of flip-flops from one area and a section from another, we can match them up like the UPC, um, you know, the, the barcodes on the back of a, something we want to purchase and match those up to correlate. In fact, it's, it varies so much on the, ratio, on the rate of flip-flops that normally we have these things going from you know, normal to reverse on scales of hundreds of thousands to a few millions of years. But in the mid-Cretaceous, there was an interval where except for a few anomalies, it was on magnetic normal, which is the version we have today, for 40 million years. So it's highly complex. Finally, uh, and this is the last sort of stratigraphy I'm throwing out here, is what we call stable isotope stratigraphy. Not stuff based on radioactive decay, but rather the changes of some ratios of, of stable versions of those isotopes due to different inputs into the Earth system. Maybe erosion, uh, in the case of, of, of some, maybe it has to do with the grow and sh growth and shrinking of ice sheets, etc. Now these require mass, mass spectrometers that are very sensitive. Look at the, the differences in here of the ratio. So it's only really here in the one, first, second, third, fourth um, digit. Um, but if we have two rocks and we're saying, ah, oh, we think they're in both in the middle Miocene as we figure out from the, the biostratigraphy, but one has a value uh, astronium uh, ratio up here and another down here, we'd say, aha, these are from different moments in the middle Miocene. And so here's the strontium curve going back further in time. It gets tougher when we get earlier in time because we don't have as continuous a record. But here's sort of the idea again. We can sort of correlate two moments by looking at their strontium ratios. And here are the uh, oxygen curves in recent geologic time. And so ultimately, there is no one way we figure out how old something is. We use a combination of different measurements, as much data as we can throw in there to figure out how old something was uh, based on the physical rock and their position to each other, based on the fossil content, based on the, if we're lucky enough, radioactive isotopes and igneous rocks that are found in there, if it's geologically young, the radiocarbon, etc.
So I see uh -huh, that I've got a five minute warning, which is great because that was the end. After this is over, we're gonna pop over to the Discord, but I got five minutes now. So let me get some of the Q and A's from the Q and A. Oh, how are, okay, how are formations named? Do those who first identify them get to choose the name? Yes, it's similar to naming in biology. Uh, where the describer is the person who gets to name them. Now there are um, conventions. We, we typically name them after a location, a spot, which is near to the um, type section. There is a type section, a, a segment of that rock that you define the base of it as. Uh, so the Morrison Formation is named after a spot in Morrison, Colorado. Some of the older, uh, particularly European formations were named before that convention. So they have like the great oolite and, and so forth. But today it's, um, uh, it is now done as a, um, uh, a location basis. So where, what and where, this is from Arts Boots Coleman, where, what and where is the oldest rock? Please define rock in the answer. A rock is a naturally occurring cohesive solid Comprised of one or more, one or more minerals or mineraloids. A mineraloid does not have a regular crystalline structure. A mineral does. The oldest current ones um, are the Acastanice and comparable, which is in Greenland, and comparable aged rocks in Jack Hills in Australia. They're on the order of about 4.03 billion years old. Um, there are individual crystals of, uh, of garnet, which are older, um, um, of zircons actually, of, of zircons, which are older. Those zircon crystals date to about 4.4 billion years old, but they're individual crystals that then got reworked, that is eroded, deposited, and incorporated into a younger rock. So if we find the source rock from those, that will be older. Incidentally, the Eoarchean era and the Archean Eon are defined as the age of the oldest known rock. So as you find older rocks, the Archean will get older and older, and the Hadean, which is the time from the formation of the Earth to the oldest preserved rock, the Hadean's going to get smaller and smaller. It's sort of a Zen time period. You cannot pick up a piece of rock from the Earth and say it's from the Hadean, because if you've picked it up, you have extended the Eoarchean older and eliminated more of the Hadean. Um, Renee writes, um, a while ago I read that carbon dating would not be useful uh, within 50 years due to the dumping of so much carbon into the atmosphere. The carbon dating for the future will be, will be mucked up because of all the stuff that we, the increase in C uh, and carbon produced by our effects. But the stuff we're finding in the rocks would it, would uh, cause it, it would still be there. We'd still be able to figure it out. Um, can we see Inky? Unfortunately, Inky is running around right now. I can't pick her up. Um, what causes the magnetic pole to flip? You figure that out. You're going to get the highest award in geology because um, right now we don't know. That is actually an active area of research, including by colleagues of mine at the University of Maryland who have constructed physical spinning multimeter balls of sodium that they're running around and trying to see what causes the magnetic flips to occur. Um, done. Please finish up. Well, there are a few other questions that I see. I will answer them over in Dis the Discord channel if we want to go. Thank you for showing up. Um, and um, I hope you are enjoying Balticon. Please consider giving money uh, to BizFizz to help support this and take care.